I want to uh, tell you a story uh, about a 14th century Italian castle in 1960s American blues music and, uh, and the distance between the two of those places. I, I make my living helping people tell stories online. It's a little bit of an extension on Linda's story. Uh, in particular, brands. And, and, and the Mitt, I don't agree with a lot of Mitt, what Mitt, Rom Mitt Romney says, but uh, corporations are people. Uh, is, is, is kind of true, and, and corporations want to act like people online. They, they want to be followed and retweeted and, and liked and, and repinned uh, in this new social media world that we're in. And so when I do my job well, I create content uh, that helps brands have conversations with customers, uh, new customers, existing customers. And when I do my job really well, uh, this content, videos, witty pieces of editorial, infographics. Uh, they, they travel around all different kinds of communities. And, uh, and that's like the holy grail in this world. There's a, there's a name for this profession now called content marketing. It's one of a bunch of buzzwords that are going on right now. Brand newsrooms and real-time marketing. And, um, and, and the holy grail in this space is you want your stuff to go viral. I was having a conversation with someone earlier. How do I get my stuff to go viral? Um, and I think what people like about going viral, it, 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 it makes them feel credible, authentic. I'm, a lot of people are looking at my stuff. And we are really addicted to um, sharing and looking at other people's stuff right now. We are highly, highly um, into it. We share a lot of stuff. We spend a lot of time uh, in front of screens. Uh, that's me. Um, and we are sharing a lot of objects, and not everything needs to be shared. Not everything is worth retweeting. Not everyone needs a Twitter account. Uh, not everyone needs to react to every piece of, uh, of content that is, is thrown in front of them. And I tell a lot of my clients this, that you don't necessarily need to have a Twitter account. Uh, and it's sort of a dirty little secret. That isn't so much of a secret, and not everybody wants to hear it. Um, but, but it's the truth. Not every story is worth sharing. Uh, the other thing is, I am uh, not really, I'm in this content marketing space, but I'm not necessarily a content marketer. I'm really this guy. Um, and I, I'm a bit of a reluctant entrepreneur. I, about four years ago, I was in the middle of a digital startup death spiral. Which, if you're in the digital, if you're in the startup world in general, if you're if you're an entrepreneur in general, that happens a lot. Most startups fail. Most businesses fail. Uh, but for me, I left the relative uh, safety and security and predictability of uh, the music business <laughs> to to, um, to to go into an entrepreneurial adventure. Uh, I started like one foot in and one foot out. It was someone else's money and someone else's. Uh, skin in the game, but it allowed me to sort of feel what this space might be like. And after a few months, it was going under. And that was a, a, a scary thing. And, and I, I, I'd been, I had one foot in, one foot out for a long time because I had this false sort of equation that entrepreneurship uh, equal to responsibility in some way. I, I, I'd worked for entrepreneurs. I've known a lot of entrepreneurs. And I've seen the collateral damage uh, that entrepreneurship can bring uh, in this quest of you know, doing what you doing what you want to do at all costs, uh, and, and and if people get run over, so be it. Uh, I am the son of an entrepreneur. Uh, I was uh, some of that collateral damage. My, my father was a uh, a talent agent in the 1960s. He uh, booked a lot of musical acts, and in 1975. He just started to uh, decide to start a cookie company. He decided he wanted to uh, sell cookies in 1970s Hollywood on Sunset Strip, uh, where there are a lot of hookers and a lot of drunks and a lot of drug dealers, and it's the perfect place for a cookie store. <laughs> um, and uh, he he was right, and he uh, he spent uh, many years uh, sort of defining entrepreneurial success. Uh, he was on the cover of magazines, and he was in uh, the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, 
and he was on a lot of uh, shows at the time, and he was a pop culture icon. And he was also in the middle of a failed marriage. This is my mother. Uh, actually, this is Shirley May, which was her stage name. Uh, and while my father was a talent agent in the 60s, she was a nightclub singer. She sang around here in New York. She sang at a club in Atlantic City called Club Harlem, where uh, after they would uh, bang on the tables with little sticks to, to, instead of applauding. She studied at Carnegie Hall uh, with uh, a guy named Phil Moore, who taught Lena Horne and Marilyn Monroe how to sing. She had a record deal with Mercury, uh, a record deal with Mercury Records. And she um, was scouted one night by my father. And I was uh, the result of that scouting. Um, <laughs> my father scouted a lot of people. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, so, it, it's sort of uh, it, it's, it, it's a family uh, trait. So, uh, so, uh, so they, they picked up, they moved to, uh, from New York out to uh, Hollywood. And they started a family of froze. And, <laughs> and it was sort of uh, somewhat idyllic, uh, or, or, or so it seemed. But I didn't really uh, know this woman at all. Uh, this is the woman that I knew. Um, my mother uh, developed mental illness way before I was born. And what my father thought was sort of wacky behavior was actually the beginnings of what's called schizoaffective disorder. Um, and she was full-blown by the time I was born. Uh, and it took her life. She took her own life uh, in 2003. Uh, she was spent her entire life being mismedicated, undermedicated, overmedicated, misdiagnosed, uh, surrounded by people, including myself, who um, loved her, but uh, like a lot of mental illness, uh, spent a lot of time ignoring the depths of her problem. Uh, and she uh, died alone. And the thing was, you know, the thing is with, with mental illness, it, as tragic as it is, the mentally ill are really good storytellers. Like really great storytellers. They tell a lot of wacky stories. Um, and it takes uh, a lot of um, mental acuity to figure out you know, the reality from the fantasy in these stories. But they're, they're wonderful and they're fanciful uh, in, in, in certain instances. She died um, while I was on my way to Raleigh, North Carolina, to get conservatorship over her, to get her committed, basically. And on the way to the airport, I got the news that she killed herself. She killed herself thinking that someone had killed me. Uh, and when I got to her apartment, she'd written on the mirror, uh, they killed Sean. It's sort of this, uh, this uh, you know, clue to mystery detectives of this mystery uh, in her mind. And so I am uh, you know, the son of an errant cookie man and, and a mentally ill nightclub singer, which maybe should have been the lead of the, of, of the story. Uh, so as, as you could imagine, uh, there is a need for uh, predictability uh, that day jobs you know, provide uh, and in control, which entrepreneurship sort of provides. Uh, at least that's what my shrink tells me. So, um, so I spent a lot of time uh, you know, trying to have it both ways. So I'm in the middle of this digital death spiral, uh, and I had two choices. I could go back or I could go forward. So I decided to go forward into this, deeper into this digital space. That was new to me. It's new to all of us. We're all playing with these toys, like kids still right now. And uh, I started a company to help people tell their stories online, to help brands tell their stories online help them figure out whether they should be on Twitter or be on Facebook or be on LinkedIn and how do they talk to their consumers and how do they be authentic? How can they be credible uh, in, in this new world, these new consumers? How do they communicate in this new way where 30-second ads don't really, uh, aren't the only way to talk anymore? We're, we've gone from one-way communication to two-way communication. So uh, that's my job. And I'm a success. It's a success for this guy. Woohoo. <laughs> Uh, so, but the, the thing was, I, I sort of, I, I left him out of the room uh, for a while. So I, I have this gig, and I buy some suits. I hadn't owned a suit before. Uh, and I'm suddenly hanging out with lots of people who have C's in front of their names, CMOs, CFOs, COOs, uh, a lot of C's. And there was a, a thing in my head that said, 
well, you have to, um, the kid's not allowed in there. You have to act like a smart content marketing guy. So I spent a lot of uh, um, time giving advice to people about how to be authentic while I was feeling less and less authentic myself. Uh, and that was an interesting uh, conundrum. So then I, uh, I get a call. Uh, I get a call to go to Italy. And the call's from a buddy of mine who I used to play in a band with. Um, so back in my, my, my music days, my, my, uh, my less than stable, lovely music days. And he uh, still plays music, but he's also gotten into the wine business. And he uh, knows a lot of people who drink a lot of fine wine uh, in Italy. And uh, one of them owns a castle, because why not? <laughs> um, so, and he likes the blues. So this guy owns a castle, wants to hear some blues, and he asked my friend, can you find me uh, a blues band? He's all put a blues band together. So he says, Sean, put some songs together, come over and, uh, and sing the blues. So my kid answered the call. And I, uh, I went with my wife. We left our kids at home, which is a critical move. Uh, and we went to a little town uh, called uh, Cison di Valmarina. It's in northern Italy. It's about a 45-minute drive northwest of, of Venice. And uh, there the, uh, the reverend was born. And uh, this is the, the reverend Sean Amos, which is different than the guy you're seeing on stage tonight. So uh, the, first of all, he has uh, better suits. Uh, he's got better shoes. And, um, and he leads with his heart. And he's, he's wholly authentic. Um, so we were um, playing one night, it's April 6, 2013, playing a Johnny Guitar Watson song. Johnny Guitar Watson uh, actually died on stage playing the blues. So uh, one blues man dies, another one is born. And I was standing there looking out at a bunch of Europeans who were um, seeing me as this sort of missing lost link from you know, Robert Johnson or Muddy Waters to, to, to current day. Uh, and I realized they were kind of right. Like, I was. This was, uh, this was my music. I mean, it's your music too, but it's kind of more my music than your music movie. And, and, and in, a, in, a, in, a, in a flash, I sort of, I felt my, uh, I felt my, uh, my mother and all the clubs that she had sang, and I felt uh, my father and the similar acts that he had put into clubs. Uh, and I felt all of this history of mine uh, that um, I had sort of forgotten about or denied. And I found a piece of myself again. And it was uh, a lovely thing to come back to LA and have now him be in the room with me with all these sea level guys. So now when I'm talking to uh, all manner of people, all of me is talking. And, and this is sort of the big lesson for me, I'll leave Junior for a second, um, that we need, all of us needs to show up. All parts of us need to show up. 